I want to say thank you to Stephen and to Tom for inviting me here to talk today. I've really, I'm really enjoying every minute. I'm enjoying particularly the networking we're doing. Uh, over lunch I was networking with a lady I'd never met before called Lee and we got on very well and I could see the parallels between her life and mine and I hope you're all having the same networking experience that I'm having, we've had. And also, we, when I think about it, the networking is very much like um, soil micro, microorganisms. When you think about it, the net, networking between the bugs in the soil, the bugs and the, what the soil is doing for the plants and what the plants are doing for the um, people who eat them, it's all about networking. And networking is very, very important. So we end up with a, ta a talk here called Healthy Soils, Healthy Food, Healthy People. And that is exactly the way it is. Um, I was also very amused listening to Sabrina's fight with the health department earlier. And I'm very, very, you know, I, I acknowledge the role of WorkSafe because I know how important that is. But just, the, I mean, it was really... It's quite funny, Sabrina. I know it's not funny to you, or it probably was funny, having these people say, you shan't grow peanuts, with these Aboriginal kids who never get sick. They don't get sick because they've been brought up with microorganisms, with bullshit and all sorts of things like that. Of course they don't have allergies. There are no allergies, basically, statistically, in the Aboriginal world. But we know that in every school our kids aren't allowed to take peanut butter sandwiches in case some other kid might have an anaphylactic reaction to that. And that's a real tragedy. And it's what's happened to become, what's come when we didn't pay attention to the importance of dirt in our lives. The next thing I wanted to do is to pay tribute to the Aboriginal people who originally owned this land. I'm sure you're all aware of that and you don't need me to remind you. But they were farmers. They were the very first farmers who came to this country 60,000 years ago, we think, and they farmed the place right from the outset. They were doing it right. And if you've got any doubts at all, read this book because it's a fantastic book and it's talking about the, the big, this giant farm that was called Australia. Also, this is a more recently written book. Oh, Bill Gamage is actually alive. I think he's still alive and well. But Bruce Pascoe is a younger guy and he's, he talks about how far, um, Aboriginal people were farmers of this land and that's well worth reading that so you've got some idea of what was really happening to, when the land was owned and run by people who were, saw themselves as farmers. And I, I know there was um, some uh, confrontation in Fremantle about whether you'd have Australia Day on the 26th of January or whether you ought to um, change it to another day. Well, I'll just say, you know, put my hand up here and say my vote is for making Australia Day the 25th of January, which was the last day that the Australian Aboriginals owned, owned and ran this place because they were, you know, they were doing farming, they were doing it all right, they were doing it the way we should be doing it, the way that I think Tom is trying to tell people and Steve is trying to tell we, us we ought to be doing it. Now, I, want, I, I don't read my slides, I don't like reading my slides because I know all you guys can read, except the few, patch, few, few perhaps unfortunate people might have been raised on Ritalin and never could learn to read. But I just want to read this slide because I like this slide. Nature is not benign. The survival of the human species not species, is not a preordained evolutionary program. Genetic variation exists, not necessarily confined to what happens routinely or even frequently. It is, I think, worthwhile being conscious of the limits of our powers. We are caught in the food chain whether we like it or not eating and being eaten. This is from the coming plague. And Laurie Garrett was talking about those plagues that we all get scared of. SARS, HIV, um, the Ebola virus. And that is a result of getting things out of whack without each other. Not listening to what we're learning from the farms, not listening to what we're learning from the soil, the interaction between soil and food and plants and um, just not being healthy. 
And my, I've got two take home messages from today. One of them is getting rid of sugar. That's just the basic. And I just say to everyone, you want to get, because we've got diabetes in this country, it's getting worse. Sabrina says, looking the, at the weight of kids in the country, it really is painful. You go out and you see the, uh, um, the result of what sugar can do to people, what sugar can do in soft drink, and sugar is a poison. And one of my doctor friends, I, uh, he was asked, is what brown sugar better than white sugar? And he said, I think of sugar as ground glass. White sugar is white glass when it's powdered, and um, brown sugar is brown glass when it's powdered. And you wouldn't eat powdered glass, and you wouldn't turn, you wouldn't cook with it, and you wouldn't put it in your tea and coffee. And that's how you think of it. So one of my, that was actually taken over. For a long time, we were thinking sugar is the enemy. And then a guy in America called Ansel Keys said, "No, sugar's not the enemy. It's fat that's the enemy." And Ansel Keys came to well being came to the state of being well known in America at the time they were discovering cholesterol hence all the statins you poor people may be put on by your doctors and if they want to give you a statin just argue the case say oh you're an Ansel Keys man are you and ask why what they think about the sugar versus the um, fat argument because I personally don't think what cholesterol is, is poisonous. The stuff between my ears and your ears is two kilograms of cholesterol. So if you don't like your, your, you know, that stuff up there in your brain, then by all means, take statins, get rid of your sugar, uh, the fat. But I'm not worried about my cholesterol status. And the next thing I just want to say, this is a take home message, because I'm a doctor and I'm here today and I can talk to you, I got the, uh, I've got the possibility of saying whatever I like to say. And Tom and you know, Stephen later on can jump on me and say, why did you say that? But at the moment I'm, I'm up here, I'm talking, I've got a microphone in my hand, <laughs> so just try and stop me. <laughs> Thank you. And what I would like to say is selenium is essential. And it's up there, you can read about it. And the recommendation for everybody in the country is to take 150 micrograms a day. Now, we decided we'd do it one way. Keith decided, well, let's put it this way. When you vaccinate your, uh, you, you vaccinate your animals, you do, use six in one or seven in one, or six in one plus selenium, seven in one plus selenium, or without, if you like. But selenium, selenium, selenium. And the reason for that is multiple. There are so many good things that you can say about selenium that I, you know, I just run out of things. Even me, who historically I always could talk under wet cement. Since I got ill a couple of years ago, I don't talk as well under wet cement as I used to. But I can talk endlessly about selenium. And I say, you need to take it because when you take your kid along for a vaccination, does your doctor say, do you want the vaccination with selenium or not? Of course the doctor doesn't. They don't even know about selenium. They don't talk about it. They don't think about it because it's too hard. But I'm saying to you, no, it's not too hard. Everyone should take selenium. And they say, well, how am I going to get 150 micrograms a day? And I say, it's very easy. I'll just give you this. I'll can someone come up and get some bottles of pills for me? Thank you very much. And pass those around. Just pass them. I want everyone to look at these. <laughs> Two more. <laughs> One more. That is a very... I'm not... I don't stand for the... Um, I I'm, don't represent that company, but I just know it's dirt cheap to get that. You can get that brand anywhere. You can go to your local pharmacy and say, look, I want you to carry this and uh, keep it in stock because I'm going to buy it because I'm going to take one of those tablets every day for the rest of my life and I will be here to buy it for, from you. And I make sure the pharmacies near my surgeries both have those in stock all the time so that I can just say to my patients, go and get selenium. Why am I getting selenium? Well, I'll tell you a bit more in the moment about that. But 
there was a guy in America, I'm sorry, in South Australia called Professor Graham Young. And Graham Young is a professor of cancer at Adelaide University. And he said if everybody took 150 micrograms a day of selenium, we would halve the rate of cancers in this, in this country, including prostate cancer, including bowel cancer, including breast cancer, and you just know, it goes on and on. All the common cancers, the ones that we're all scared of getting, take one of those a day, open them up and have a look at them. They're tiny tablet. I almost have to remember whether I've taken it or not. I think, you know, Yes, there's my selenium. It was so little I didn't even feel it going down. They cost less than two cents a tablet and they're dirt cheap. And yeah, we all should take it. Now, that would bring me on to the question of do I believe in supplements? Ideally, we should get it from our food. It should be in the soil and it should be in the food. If it is in the soil, um, that doesn't necessarily will, means we'll get it because it's in the soil. The plant will get it if it's in the soil, if it's got the right mycorrhizal fungi. If the, plant, uh, the fungi in the soil have not been killed with her pesticides, herbicides and sprays. So you've got to get the selenium into the soil and then you've got to get the plant to absorb it and then you've got to get the people to eat the plant that's got the selenium in it. We know that garlic and onions are good sources of selenium if there's any there to be had. But um, we also know that if there's no mycorrhizal fungi, they're not going to get the selenium into them. And therefore, or if people don't like garlic and onions, I don't like garlic and onions. I think, well, tough, you know, you won't like having bowel cancer either. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm getting, as I get older, I get more blunt and I say to patients, well, tough, you try this. And I, I never used to say it to patients. I was always nice, Miss Goody Two Shoes, never said anything that upsets anybody. Now I don't care who I upset because I know <laughs> it is actually important that they know these things. So there's the periodic table and there's got some very important minerals in it. Keith later on, um, Keith Husband over there in the corner, he will be selling some of my books if anybody's interested to get them and get summarise all the things I'm trying to say, but I realise I sound drunk, I feel drunk, but I'm not drunk. I'm drunk <laughs> on what I know, but I, I'm not, you know, I'm not drunk, I promise you. <laughs> I'm gentamice and affected definitely. So he'll have a periodic table up there with him. Now, this, is, this talk has been collated from several other talks that I've given at various conferences, and one of them was about the small things in life. Now, the, the thing about the small things in life, this slide I pulled out of another, um, another talk I was giving, because I was talking about the big and the small things that are important. And I said it's very interesting that in nature, Mother Nature has put at the bottom of the food chain, the very bottom of the food chain, the most important things we need. We need omega-3 fatty acids and we need selenium. And all our selenium-dependent enzymes are right there at the bottom of the food chain. And all the and their, their selenium is in, in the minerals that the um, are feeding the algae and that it, and then we. Uh, I remember speaking, sorry, but I'm, I remember speaking at a conference once and somebody actually put their hand up and said, do you mean we should be eating the slime out of the, uh, the water troughs? And we had water troughs all over our farm and I had to stop Geraldine, who was there helping us, from scrubbing them out. She said, they're getting green algae all over them, Carol. And I said, well, that's great. That's exactly what the alpacas need. They need to have that because when they're eating the green algae, they're getting the omega-3 fatty acids and they're getting the selenium that were in the rocks, in the water, in the first place. And I stopped her... Um, scrubbing out the slime. I hope I'm not encouraging any of you to go and eat the slime off your water troughs. <laughs> but it, let me tell you, if you do eat slime off your water troughs, you're not going to be any worse for it. <laughs> so, some modern health problems. What can farmers teach doctors? Well, there was something else I I was going to read out to you, which I will do right now while I think of it. I have these slides to keep me on track so I can remember what I'm talking about. And so I want to read the first thing here, 
which is this. It was Voltaire. I was trying to remember his name yesterday, but it's Voltaire. He said, the doctors of today prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of whom they know almost nothing. Now, you say that to your GP and see how far it gets you. <laughs> but that was Voltaire back in 1694. He was born in 1694. He died in 1778. So if your GP wants to give you a whole lot of drugs and pharmaceutical agents, just, you just have to read out that one sentence to them. And they stare at you with your mouth, their mouth dropping wide open, I can assure you. And then I want to go on a bit further. Because when I got excited about selenium, which I did in the early days of the alpacas, one of our alpacas got sick and I um, contacted Pat Colby, who we, I was talking about with someone earlier today. And Pat Colby was talking about a degree, a type of, somebody here actually was mentioning Col Pat Colby when Sabrina was asking, you know, picking on the guys, as she said. Um, this person said, I used some Pat Colby methods, and I think, good on you, mate, because that's exactly what gets, gets you well and keeps you well. Pat Colby was right on the money. She knew what she was doing. But she also, I wrote to her at one stage, and she said, you need to give these animals, uh, our alpacas were sick, and I, I talked to Pat Colby, and we could, it sort of it developed a nice friendship thereafter. And one of the things, she said, are you related to Tom Hungerford, the vet? Well, I actually, via Keith, I am related to Tom Hungerford, the vet, because Tom Hungerford wrote a fantastic book, which some of you, especially the older ones of you might have, which is called Diseases of Livestock. And Tom Hungerford, he, this is something he read, wrote in his book, which I think is fantastic, and therefore I thought I'd like to read it to you. In the past, this is him talking where he's written. He read, wrote this as a letter which he sent to me. Um, in the past 30 years, each time I have written a new edition of Diseases of Livestock, I am appalled by the fact that after white, that white muscle disease is well recognised in a common condition in lambs, sheep and goats, cattle and to a lesser extent in horses, pigs and rarely other species. But to no, no comparative observations are available on humans. If a veterinarian has multiple stage cases of cardiac failure with sudden deaths in lambs, calves or kids, he automatically looks for myocardial infarction and selenium deficiency. And with clinical pathology and biochemical backup, he may find it as the common cause. If a medical man in humans has a cardiac arrest, and myocardial infarction on post-mortem, he automatically looks for coronary occlusions, thromboembolic emergencies, or arithematous conditions, and he may find them. He thinks in terms of cholesterol excesses, nicotine, alcohol, etc., but never in terms of selenium deficiency as one possible cause. Now, this is the bit I like particularly, and I think Stephen would understand this immediately. In the animal field, we all know of the relationship between selenium and sulfates, nitrates and calcium, so that sulfates, nitrates and high dietary calcium decrease the absorption of selenium in cattle and has been associated with muscular dystrophy, metritis, clinical mastitis and retained placenta. placenta. In this condition, note the human fact that postmenopausal women are encouraged to take more calcium by recommendation of dietitians. Indeed, the matter of trace mineral interrelationships is very delicate. Think of dietary intake of molybdenum, sulphur, zinc, iron, cadmium and calcium. All decrease the availability of dietary copper to animals. To summarise, selenium deficiency and its possible interrelationships with heart and muscle conditions in humans needs critical investigation. The veterinary profession has so much data at its fingertips, it is a tragedy if this is not brought to the foremost of thought by the medical profession. Now, 
basically what he's saying is if vets know this, they look at the animals, they see they're sick, they do something about it. Why don't doctors think the same way? And that is exactly my point. Why don't doctors ever think by looking at the animal, i.e. people, you people out there, why don't they look at the animal and think, what's going on here? What is this person eating? Um, so, uh, what can farmers teach doctors? They can teach them a bloody lot, let me tell you. Now, cancer, <laughs> think minerals. If you're thinking about cancer, you think, if I'm a doctor and someone comes to me and they've got cancer or malignant condition, I think about selenium. I think about iodine. I think about zinc. I think about magnesium, I think about molybdenum, and possibly these days I think about germanium. Missing in action, selenium. So that is worth looking at that. I've got a lot more, lot more information. If anybody wants any of the things that I'm referring to, they, you can ask Tom or you can ask um, Stephen and you can give them your email address and I will email you or I'm happy for them to give you my email address and if you do email me just say you know I'm Joe Blow I was at the Albany conference because that puts it in I get a lot of mail not a lot of hate mail I might say <laughs> but I do get a lot of mail and people you know have a lot of things to say, but if I think, oh yes, those guys were at the Albany conference, it gets my head into the position of what I was saying at this conference. And if you say, I've got X problem, can what can I? What do you suggest about it? I um, will email. I will write back. I'm very good with emails. I'm not very good with IT, and I depend on all the IT literary people in the family to help me, but I am good at trying to answer emails. Now, this is something we know for a fact. If you've got BRCA genes, if you've been told, you know, your auntie died of um, bowel cancer, your auntie had um, ovarian cancer, and your auntie had her breast taken off, you've got to have mutilating surgery. We'll take out your ovaries, we'll take out your breasts, and my answer to that is yes, that's one choice. You can have the ovaries removed, you can have the breasts chopped off, we can chop off as a lot of you. There's not much of you, the human being, that doctors can't and won't chop off. But you do have another choice, and the choice is you can take one tablet a day of that stuff that I've sent around. And you can look it up on the internet. I love Google. Just go to Google and look up selenium protecting BRCA genes. It's out there. And there's a lot of studies being done on it. And missing in action, zinc is essential for genomic stability, which means that we've known about zinc fingers, we've known about genetics for a long time. But if we want those genes to be stable and reliable, then we've got to have enough zinc. And I see a lot of people who have, are zinc deficient. And I can you know, go out into the waiting room. I don't like to do this as a game, but I almost, it's a game. While the patients are thinking, that doctor looks drunk, and they're getting their head around what they're going to say to the drunk doctor. I'm thinking, you're zinc deficient. You've got copper excess. I can do something about that. I can fix that. And diabetes. We know that, you look at the Aboriginal populations in Australia, what are they dying of? They're dying of diabetes. Where are we getting, they're all got, when you get diabetes, the way you're most likely to die of is renal failure. They did a study amongst Aboriginals with renal failure and they were giving them just magnesium, nothing else, magnesium deficiency, absolutely huge. And they found that they were protecting the um, Australian Aboriginals from becoming diabetic, probably due to all the sugar. You remember we taught in primary school that we, got them to do work and we gave them a sack of flour, always white flour, a sack of sugar and some tea. No nutrition in any of that. And we know that many of them became diabetic as a result of that diet and they kept on drinking soft drink and such like. And that was just terrible. Someone earlier on was, I can't remember now, everybody's blurring into each other. I, I like this you know, a symbiosis between all of us because everything's blurred into everything. But someone early was saying, uh, who was it? Was yeah, what? Aboriginal. About Aboriginal people and but about the socks, the, they didn't have gloves. Somebody said... No shoes, no 
No shoes, yes. Well, I've got a friend who works in the Aboriginal community in Central Australia, and she, every year she has a sock drive. She said because she went out there once, somebody had infected feet, and she said, can I have a look at your feet? And when the person peeled off their sac socks, several layers of skin came off with it at the same time because the lady never wanted to take her socks off. She enjoyed having socks so much. She owned socks and that was a big deal for her. So when the, she looked at the lady's feet, she got them to take their socks off and off came all the skin with it. So now that she was in the habit of having this annual party that she invited us all to bring our spare socks to. So, you know, I, I don't know what made me think of that, but anyway. <laughs> she was looking after Aboriginals with diabetes. Now, mental health. We, some people have talked about mental health today and it's a huge thing. And again, what we need for mental health, we know we need communication. And I think it was Marie before lunch, I'm not sure, she said the wife, can, the wife organisation was created not for social purposes, but it happens inevitably that social links are made out of it and it inevitably happens amongst you women and men too that are joining in a society, you um, have a lot uh, to do with mental health. And your support for each other is so important. So my next slide, I want to show you. Uh, so if you're thinking mental health, first of all, think of the support you get from your friends and your neighbours. That is essential to mental health. But the next thing, this is a rather complicated slide. And when I put it up, in front of an audience of all doctors, they laugh. And I say, what are you laughing about? I get quite cross about it. And they, I say, you yeah, know, what are you laughing? I, said, I say to them, let's look at over here. I don't want to look up or my balance disorder might have me on the floor. No, sorry, back we go, back we go. If we look up here, if you're depressed, we'll stick you on Prozac or if you're anxious, we'll stick you on Valium. But how can we make those drugs ourselves? How can you make your own Prozac? How can you make your own Valium? Well, if you look at this, you eat dietary protein. If you've got the right amounts of copper and zinc in your gut, you will make amino acids. And one of the amino acids is tryptophan. Tryptophan goes to 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, which goes to serotonin. And serotonin is what we're making when we give you Prozac. Or you can eat the amino acids, protein, and you can turn the tryptophan into 5-HT, but that requires iron, it requires B3, and you make your 5-HT. You get 5-HT, you want to make serotonin, you need B6. Um, I'll skip over methionine just for a sec. Tyrosine goes to dopa. And we know about dopa and dopamine, low dopamine. We know with um, uh, Parkinson's disease, it's a dopamine problem. Now, why is it a dopamine problem? Well, I can tell you categorically, it's almost categorically, that you, it's pesticides. We know that muck up your dopamine producing ability and we don't want to be using the pesticides that are going to leave us with Parkinson's disease. Because in Dubbo, which is a rural capital, a big area in, in the Eastern Bloc, Dubbo has got the world's number one amount of patients with Parkinson's disease. And it's, we, do it, we believe it's due to um, their dopamine being mixed up. And yet we can make dopamine out of um, using tyrosine, we'll turn it to dopa if we use enough manganese. And from dopa, we can go to dopamine if we use more B6. And then dopamine goes to nor, nor, I can't read this, nor epinephrine, nor adrenaline. And you'll see there copper and, uh, copper and vitamin C in this exchange program. If you're getting too much copper, you will go forward from dopamine, you make too much noradrenaline. If I've got anxious patients, I 
measure their copper levels, and if their copper levels are very high, then I know they're a very anxious person, and I want to bring the copper level down. And what drives all that back? Go right back down to the bottom left-hand side of that diagram is zinc. So we want copper and zinc in a good balance with each other. And if a person's got high copper, they're anxious and very you know, fretful, I give them zinc because that will bring the copper down and it will bring them to make them a less, much less anxious person. So that's an imbalance there with vitamin C. I'm using vitamin C and I'm using those, that approach to patients with schizophrenia because we know they've got a dopa and a dopamine but disorder. So when we think about dopamine, we sh that dopamine is your calm, relaxing, focusing, concentrating hormone. And when you think if a person hasn't got enough dopamine, they're anxious all their time, they're always ready for a disaster, then they need zinc. And if we've got schizophrenics or I've got Parkinson's patients, I'm thinking about what's their copper, what's their zinc in ratio, where are they getting those nutrients from and where are they getting them from their diet. We know Australia is very low in zinc and we know that we, they ought to be getting zinc out of their food if they're eating good food. But this is an ancient continent and many of the minerals have been washed out in the oceans. So we want to get, they once again, we want to get those goodies from our diet. But, you know, if we're getting, we're eating broccoli, like this guy was saying, the cropper over there in the corner, I think it was Gary, he was saying they're eating broccoli, had split in the middle, it needs boron. And, yeah, exactly. As a doctor, I can almost, any illness a patient comes to me with, I can say, yes, I know you, you've got cancer, you need selenium. But I know you go sometimes into the supermarket. I went in once and there was a lady, she had obviously had lost her hair because she had chemotherapy for her breast cancer and she was buying broccoli. And I just stood there thinking to myself, no, that broccoli is not going to do you any good. It's not organic. It's not going to have pesticides all over and it's going to be boron deplete and boron we need to build up our bones. We need to build it. It's a, one of the arguments against cancer. And if you're buying broccoli, broccoli is supposed to be good if you've got cancer and it is good if you've got cancer, but it's got to be organic broccoli because if it's otherwise grown with pesticides, it's going to be boron deplete and it's not going to help you. Missing in action, iodine. We've got these kids all over the place and they're behaving like horrible little children. And you were saying earlier, sorry, 10 minutes, yeah, um, horrible little kids and we think they need a good smack. They need a good smack or they need some iodine. And if you um, get kids, you can measure their iodine. I can measure it in their urine specimen, a very simple test. And if they're very low in iodine, these kids are swinging from the chandeliers. They're horrible kids. They'll be labelled as ADHD. They'll be put on Ritalin, which is not going to do anything. It's just going to add another drug to the problems they've got enough. They've got a lot of problems possibly at home. Maybe, maybe mum and dad are broken. For, uh, the farm's going broke and maybe mum and dad are fighting. The kid's got enough problems. He does not need iodine deficiency as well. So I can put him on iodine instead of Ritalin and I can hope for the best. But I see these kids again and I, they are invariably doing well. So gut bacteria are terribly, terribly important. We were talking Nicole and me, and maybe she will take this up when she's talking, but human, the human body has got 30, about 37 trillion cells in it. In our body, about 37 trillion cells. But on the surface of our body, on the bacteria, on the surface of the body, on the skin and in the vagina in females, in the ear canals, in the gut, the gut, the gut bacteria. We've got a hundred trillion bacteria. So obviously nature knew something that we don't know. Nature knows that we need three times as many bacteria as we need cells in our body. Now Mother Nature doesn't put three times as much of, as much of anything into the body as you know, they're very tiny bacteria, obviously, or otherwise I'd be walking around and all you'd see is all these bacteria. But 
you don't see them. They're small, they're tiny. In my gut, I've got several kilograms just of bacteria. When you go to the toilet and you, you, when you open your bowels, a lot of the material that comes out is fibre, but a lot of that material in the faeces is just bacteria. And it is through gut bacteria they are playing a big role in our, their, our immune system and gut bacteria are the most important. If I've got patients who come and they say, I've got an immune disorder, Carol, or they say, you know, I've oh, got an autoimmune disease, I, I'm most likely to say to them, I want to do an analysis of your gut bacteria. I want to look at your aerobes and your anaerobes and I want to make sure what's going on because I can find out if you've got arthritis and arthritis pain just looking at your bacteria, which I send away to a specialist bacteriologist who does nothing but this. And he's looking at people's bugs in his, their gut and I can do a lot about that person's health just based on their bacteria. And we know that they're the biggest part of the immune system. When you think about the immune system, you think about the liver, you think about the white cells, but they're only a tiny fragment of our immune system. 95% of our immune system is in our gut bacteria. And I've got uh, in this book somewhere, I've got a thing called, let's see, the gut's contribution to immunity. And apart from me, I'm not going to read seven pages of it, but there's no eight pages, ten pages of gut, the gut's contribution to immunity. So if someone comes to me and says, I've got a belly ache, my doctor's got me on, um, what's it called? Uh, Zocor, Xantin, uh, Zantac. I just shudder and I just say, well, we're going to stop that sooner or later. Stay on it for the moment because it's giving you relief but I'm going to get you off the Zantac because it's only harming your gut bacteria. It's just like putting a pesticide in the gut. It says, we don't like the bugs in your gut. We're going to upset the bugs more. We'll give you Zantac. Then you'll feel better, but you won't be better. You'll get sicker and you'll get other problems. They may be cancers. Who knows what they are? So the next thing is... I'm just very quickly, because I'm down to about two minutes now. What excites me now? Six. You have six minutes. Oh, six whole minutes. <laughs> goody, goody. Um, so what excites me now, I printed it out, because I was going to do a conference in Dubbo, and then Keith got sick. He wasn't even sick. They thought he was sick. The doctors thought he was sick. So we had to stay at the hospital to get a, the a result of an ECG which showed he wasn't sick, but it was too late to do, to do the conference by then to get from the farm to Dubbo. But it was about how we're all made of stardust, just like the soil is made of stardust and the, anim um, the plants, everything is made of stardust. And this excited me. So I printed this out and we had 100 copies ready to go to Dubbo and you are the lucky recipients instead. I believe you've all got one of these copies in your bag or a handout. I'm looking to see if I've got one. But it's... Here it is. It looks like that. On one side it's un underlined in yellow. It's black and white. Plate tectonics may have driven the life of evolution of life on Earth. Now that is really, really interesting. And if you turn to the back page it says something. It says something, definitely. <laughs> and it says a lot, actually. But it's about... Uh, work is currently underway demonstrating that these events are tied to the rapid declines in certain essential trace elements, particularly selenium. Hence my carrying on about... If a person has got cancer, something has gone wrong. And if I think it's selenium, I can't rely on that person eating enough onions and garlic that were grown organically using um, Stephen's... What, I can't rely on that. I just want you to take one of those every day so that when... It was so important, selenium was so important. Gosh, everything ends up on the floor. But, you know, 
selenium was so important that stardust that came out of the stardust it's so important i can't rely on you eating enough onions and garlic to get that selenium in to ward off the cancer we don't we might i might not have time with that patient i might not ever see that patient again but at least if they've got that their step one is towards getting um uh, getting control of their cancer or preventing it and so that's what excites me. It, it's what keeps me going at medicine. At the age of 71, I still want to be out there. I still want to be, have people taking selenium. And also, I want to take them, get them to take magnesium and zinc. All those funny-looking kids, all the kids with ADD instead of Ritalin, I want them to be on zinc. If they need it, I can test it. I can find that out. If they need iodine, I want those kids to have um, iodine so that they will be able to function normally. So their bodies will be able to function normally. Their brains, you, those of you who've been given Prozac or who've been given anything, told to take your ovaries out, I want to be able to say to you, that may not necessarily be the way. Certainly women with menstrual disorders, magnesium is the bottom line, but magnesium and zinc, things like that, I've got to get those things right because I know my patients do well, they do very well. And that's why I spent five years writing this book and five years then stupidly um, writing this, uh, the follow-up. It's not a sequel, but I was talking about migraine headache. So the scientists in this article were talking about my elements, the things that I go on about. They were going on about, you know, the things Carol talks about, zinc and magnesium, and if you want you know, to stop, you know, if you've got osteoporosis, I want you on boron, I want, to, you want, you have, I want you on magnesium, I want you on zinc. I want to know that you're getting all of those things. And I've been going on and on and on about it and explaining about it. And so when I heard these scientists on the radio were talking about this stuff, I thought they're talking about my elements as though I own the periodic table. <laughs> You know, but they're my elements because I believe in them very deeply. Folic acid, they talk about don't take folic acid, might give you cancer. Bollocks, you know, just as I say that is bollocks. Folic acid does not, never gave anybody else cancer. You, I mean, folic acid needs a whole hour's worth of talk on its own. It does not cause cancer and we, it does good things and there's some of the good things that folic acid does. And I reckon I've just about come to my six minutes. That's the book, I, one of the books I've written, and that's the other one. Thank you very much for putting up with the Duncan Doctor.